I'm approaching this from the sideline, as you know. If you know Creative Commons, then you'll realize that I have a slightly different take on this than a lot of the presentations that we've heard so far today. But on the other hand, I've also come to realize over the day here that we have so many common issues, and this is going to be about that. So. I'm the regional coordinator for Creative Commons in Europe and Central Asia, a position which I'm actually transitioning over to another organization now called the Shuttleworth Foundation, where I have a fellowship for over the next year, make metadata attractive. I want to make metadata as attractive so that when we start talking to people about metadata, they don't immediately go, oh, now we're talking about something else. Um, I want people to actually be interested, to engage in metadata. Um, everything from you guys in here to the people on the street to people who are photographing their cats, they should know that metadata is important. Because one of the things that has become abundantly clear today here is that the value of a creative work is important. And the value to me is expressed most clearly by the fact that each of us who creates a work is attributed to that work. That it says some, somewhere that this is my work. This is, you know, John Doe who has created this. Because through that attribution, you then eventually start making money. But some background on Creative Commons to start us off with. Now, Creative Commons is a set of standardized licenses for expressing a set of rights and obligations for digital works. It was founded on the belief that copyright was simply too complicated. People didn't understand it, it was going too far. But also that copyright was slightly too coarse. It was either, you know, saying that, here, this is it, this is public domain, take it, do whatever you want with it, or we had a sort of full copyright protection. And then in the middle there, you had a huge gray area with all the rights that we've been talking about here today, expressed in various ways and forms. Um, and it's very difficult for people to actually understand what they could and could not do with the work. So Creative Commons set out to create a set of licenses in a simple way, such that you would always know that if someone says that this is licensed under Creative Commons attribution, you would know exactly what that means in terms of the rights and obligations that you have. But Creative Commons approached this from the sort of openness perspective. And I'm a champion of openness, so if you want to talk open data, open access, open standards, open source, or anything else open, then you can come to me. Because the baseline of the Creative Commons licenses is that verbatim copying and distribution is always allowed. If you see that something is under a Creative Commons license, this is what you can do. You can distribute it verbatim and copy it to a friend, or use it in your magazine, or do anything else in that. But on top of that, the author can limit the use to only non-commercial use by saying, I use the Creative Commons attribution non-commercial license, for instance. Or restrict it to only verbatim use, so disallowing derivative works based on the work that you've created. Or say that, I don't want you to re-license this work to someone else. I want to keep exactly the same license through all permutations and derivative works. Answering yes or no to these questions creates a set of six different licenses, and that's it. That's the scope of Creative Commons. Six different licenses that each have their own peculiarities. One of the points of Creative Commons is that you don't need to ask permission. You don't need to register your work anywhere. We have this very simple language. We have simple icons. So you can look at a work, see the icon, and say, ah, this is Creative Commons, blah, blah, blah. And then you know from this what you can and cannot do. And we can see that there is an interest in Creative Commons. Now, if you look at Flickr as just one example of a platform out there that houses a lot of Creative Commons material, in 2007, we had 29.5 million photos on Flickr under a Creative Commons license. 2013, just a few weeks ago, it was uh, slightly above a quarter of a billion works. So, of course, these are all of various qualities, right? is everything from pictures of cats, actually quite a lot of cats, um, up to semi-professional and professional users. So you have the neighbor next door posting pictures of their cats and iguanas and whatever they have at home. You also have the White House. You also have Nine Inch Nails. You also have Al Jazeera. You also have a lot of, of significant players in this using Creative Commons. 
but the spread is quite big. Now, every CC license exists in three different forms. We have the legal code, and that's these, you know, we try to keep it short, but it's still a number of A4 pages, you know, the kind of pages that you just scroll through and click accept without actually reading. Um, but that's the part that's readable by the lawyers. I'm not a lawyer, I should say. I'm also not a photographer, I'm a technologist. Um, we have the deed, which is in the middle, which is a simple part, which is readable by humans, not by lawyers, readable by humans. And then we have the RDFA, which is readable by computers, or understandable by computers then, let's say. And this is where CC RHEL comes in. The Creative Commons Rights Expression Language, which was developed by Hel, Hel Abelson at MIT, Ben Adida at Mozilla, and Mike Linksweyer and Nathan Jergler at Creative Commons. And this was the W3C member submission back in 2008. And it looks like this. Now, this is not terribly exciting, because it's metadata, so it's not terribly exciting. Um, this is an example of a license uh, tag or an expression of a license um, using C0. And you will see that it uses the XHTML license tag to indicate a particular license, in this case, at creativecommons.org, licenses by 3.0. It then also defines its own CC namespace to say who should this actually be attributed to and what is the URL for this person. And it then uses Dublin Core to define the title of the work. So looked at in another way, it combines three different elements, so three different standards. Dublin Core, the Creative Commons RHEL, and the XHTML. And it uses them for various purposes to express various parts of the license. Now, the XHTML license tag just gives a URL. And what's interesting is if you then follow that URL. So you go to that website, and this is what you see then. This is the website that gives the public deed for the Creative Commons 3.0 attribution license. Very simple. It simply say that you are free to share, to remix, to make commercial use of the work under the following con condition, that you must attribute whoever did this. You must write that this work was made by this person. Very simple, very understandable. There's an image that goes together with this as well. That's also very simple. And if you want, you can click through, and you can read the legal code. And then you get all these pages of legal text that defines exactly what you can and cannot do. But this is enough for most people. But if you now take this page, and you view the source of this page, you'll see that you have the things that were publicly visible, so that you are free to share, to remix, and so on and so forth. But there's also a lot of CC namespace metadata sort of embedded within this source code, which is sort of hiding in the background. And that is the expression of those license terms that this Creative Commons license means, or that it gives you. So it permits reproduction, it permits uh, distribution, it permits derivative works, but requires attribution. And that's the way that the CCRL was intended to function, that within the work itself, you only attach the, the URL of the license specification. And on that page, you have both a human readable form, but also underneath it, a machine understandable form, which can be picked out and given the CC prefix um, of the CC namespace, you can say that it permits reproduction, permits distribution, permits derivative works, and requires attribution. Now, this is a very, very simple standard, but then again, Creative Commons had very, very simple needs. We only had six different licenses that we actually need to, do, to express, and most of the rights that are embedded in this are very simple. And we don't go on and define, for instance, what does actually commercial use means. So that's a limitation. And we've tried in this standard, or when it was developed, there's an attempt to make this as generic as possible. But on the other hand, we're using the Creative Commons namespace. So quite obviously, it's biased and it's very specific to Creative Commons licenses. And the limitations are that in the permits vocabulary, there's only reproduction, distribution, and derivative works. You cannot permit anything else. On the prohibits vocabulary, you can only prohibit commercial use. That's quite limiting. Um, 
in the requires vocabulary, you can only require a notice, an attribution, or you can require the source code or a share alike license, meaning that the license then continues in, in perpetuity um, if people change it. So this is very limited, I agree. Um, and the way that this was intended to be resolved was simply to say that here's my own license. It still uses the CC namespace. It says that I'm permitting reproduction, I'm permitting distribution, I'm permitting derivative works. I require attribution, I require share alike, and I require notice. But aside from this, there's also some additional permissions that I give you on this URL. And then you follow this URL, and then you have the, the sort of free text field saying that, ah, oh, but by the way, if you actually want to use this commercially, for instance, and you don't want to attribute me, then you can get in touch with me. I will negotiate a special license. But that's obviously very inflexible, and it is not actually used currently that I know of. And we had the idea, when this was written, that as new copyright licenses are introduced, Creative Commons expects to add new permissions requirements and prohibitions. This never actually happened. <laughs> we sort of stopped at that first version and said, yeah, this is good enough for us. Let's see what the rest of the world comes up with. Um, CCRL is used by CC and anyone who uses the Creative Commons website to select a license. If you go to the creativecommons.org and use the license user and say that I want a license that permits uh, anyone to share my material to uh, maybe only non-commercially, let's say, and no derivatives, I want verbatim copies, then you'll get an HTML snippet that you can then cut and paste into your web page. And this will include this metadata. So most of the people who actually use the CC website to determine which license is right for them actually end up getting the CCRL metadata by default. It's also used in projects like Europeana. Some of you might be familiar with Europeana. They're indexing the European cultural heritage, essentially. So why is it not used more? Well, of course, as I said, it's specific to Creative Commons, and it's supported and maintained by only one organization. And that's obviously a key issue here. But what I've seen here today, and what I feel comfortable with going into the future, is that we all, in this room at least, seem to have a shared interest around metadata for licensing information. And Creative Commons very much shares this interest. We believe that there's a need for it, and we believe that this is something that needs to happen in order to move forward. But this cannot be done by individual organizations or individual part, uh, you know, stakeholders in this. CC cannot do this alone. We need a collaboration between all of us in here to do this. And that will also help when we go towards Microsoft, we go to Google, Google. Uh, we go to Yahoo, we go to Flickr, we go to YouTube, we have communication from the Creative Commons side with all these players roughly once a month, you know, just checking up on technology and see how it's going, what their thoughts are in terms of Creative Commons. But whenever we mention metadata and CCRL, they're obviously going, ah, but yeah, this is supported by just yes, Creative Commons. Um, what, it, you know, it would be so much better if there was a standard that actually worked for everyone. Um, I'm not sure if we're ever going to get there, um, but hopefully we'll be able to see some convergence during this day. Um, and I mentioned the Shuttleworth Foundation and what we're doing right now. Um, so I'll just end on that note, because I think that's really, really exciting. Um, we want to make people aware of metadata. We want to make people aware of the value of attribution, the value of actually writing someone's name on a work, saying that I got this from someone. And I want, I have a personal vision that if someone goes to a website and they see an image, and it doesn't say anywhere where this image is from or who took it, they should be thinking that there's something missing here. Um, that's the vision that I'm carrying forward within this project that I'm working on right now. And we're going to be working on developing prototypes, we're going to be developing animated short movies um, to show you the benefit of attribution and the benefit of metadata, to try to encourage people to think about it in a positive way, and to try to develop the technology to also make use of this. Because so far we've been talking a lot about actually putting the metadata in place. And from our side, we've been talking a lot about over the years in terms of putting the Creative Commons license on material, putting the CCRL metadata on the material. But we haven't been speaking so much about actually 
how we use this material in the end and how we can actually make it easier for people to use this material. And here we have various technologies that could very, very easily be implemented if we had the right metadata standard. And we're going to build this probably on XMP for the embedding part and ODRL for the licensing metadata itself. Um, and we're going to implement a prototype for WordPress and Joomla and Drupal. These are the sort of free and open source content management systems that represent about 70% of the market for content management systems today. We're going to implement support for XMP and ODRL in them as a prototype. We're not going to finish completely. We don't have the money for that. Uh, but we're going to do a prototype at least and show people that what could happen in real life is that they take an image which they find on the internet, let's say it's from Gettys, they try to embed that in their blog or in their content management system, and up pops a little image saying that, you know, what are you trying to do? This is actually from Gettys. You don't have the permission to use this. Um, not restricting them, perhaps, but at least giving them a helpful hint that you might want to think about this again. And if they say, I'm going to do that anyway, then at the very least, they should publish the image with the correct attribution. And that's what we're going to aim for. So thank you very much. Thank you very much.